The Old Testament reading is from Zechariah, chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country, and go after the one that is lost, until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, God's mercy and grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue today with our series, Your Kingdom Come, based on the words of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. And today we want to look particularly at the theme, first secure your own oxygen mask. And of course, this directive is probably familiar to all of us, certainly to anyone who's been on a plane. In the event of an emergency, a sudden loss of cabin pressure, we're told that an oxygen mask for each person will drop down from an overhead compartment now, in such an anxious moment, of course, parents might instinctively try to get the air to their children. And adult children, for their part, might focus on preserving the life of elderly parents seated next to them. In such kindness, we understand it might be instinctive, but it isn't wise. Because, of course, if we pass out from lack of oxygen, our helpless seatmates won't survive. First, secure your own oxygen mask, and then assist others around you. Well, I don't have to tell you that for the last year, we have felt like we are definitely in an emergency situation. Our plane has been in turbulent airspace. The oxygen masks have dropped. We're all gasping for air. We've experienced social isolation, loneliness, depression, layoffs. We're gasping for help and hope. 
We're searching for stability and strength. What should we do? First, secure your own oxygen mask. And here it comes. That's what Zechariah says. In this series, Your Kingdom Come, we hear how God longs for his kingdom to come to us and then through us. To us, then through us. That's the movement of Zechariah, especially Zechariah chapter 8 that we consider today. God is breathing his life-giving oxygen upon us. Large amounts of spiritual gospel-saturated oxygen. And then through us, calm in the midst of chaos, peaceful in the midst of panic, truthful in the midst of great turbulence, we can breathe that life-giving oxygen to others. Well, here they come. The life-giving oxygen is coming to us in oxygen mass dropping from chapter 8 of Zechariah. Massive blasts of gospel-saturated power. What do we want to do? First, secure your own oxygen mask. How does that life-giving oxygen of the gospel come to us in Zechariah chapter 8? Well, first of all, it tells us that God dwells with his people. The Lord says, I have returned to Zion. I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. You see, God isn't only up there. God is also down here. God isn't just in the abstract. God is in the concrete, in Jesus. He's with us. He comes to us to dwell with us. Secondly, people live in peace. Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. What a beautiful and compelling picture of harmony and happiness, of sharing and shalom. Social distancing will end, and God will do it. The exiles come home. The Lord says, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. You see, God brings the exiles home. He makes them his through his faithfulness and righteousness. He goes searching for that lost sheep, for that lost coin, to bring it home again. In faithfulness and in righteousness. Not ours, of course, but his. It is his faithfulness and his righteousness that breathes, breathes the life-giving oxygen into us. The creation is renewed. The vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give their dew. The day is coming when God will make all things new. It's a beautiful time right now in Minnesota as we're experiencing the very early part of spring we have that, that promise, that hope that the vines will begin to produce. The ground shall give its produce. The heavens shall give their due. Fasts yield to feasts. The fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. God changes mourning into dancing, sackcloth into singing. God changes deep sighs into hearts full of endless hallelujahs. Let's take a moment to just breathe in that life-giving oxygen of the gospel. What oxygen? God's presence, God's protection, God's salvation, God's renewal, God's celebration. All of these come to us freely and abundantly through Jesus Christ. First, secure your own oxygen mask. And if we don't, 
Well, then this all becomes ho-hum, cliche, jargon. We downplay the gospel's most alarming details. An innocent man died so we don't have to? A murdered man whose heart started beating again? We have God's presence, protection, salvation, renewal, and celebration? Big deal. When we don't breathe in the oxygen of this gospel, we forget its freshness, its utter and unexplainable joy. What's meant to be vibrant comes across as blasé, no big deal. We all need to be jolted to life again. So God's kingdom comes to us, and then it comes through us. First, secure your own oxygen mask. Once we're spiritually revived, then we're generous toward others. Then we reach out to people living in extreme isolation. Then we pray for families who aren't used to spending so much time together. Then we go out of our way to love people in the name of Jesus. Breathe in the spiritual oxygen of the gospel. Come alive in Jesus Christ, God's kingdom to us, and then through us. To exhibit Christ's compassion to people caught in a tailspin of fear and despair. We are thankful that right now it looks as though we may be coming out of this pandemic. Things are looking up. Things are getting better. And yet we know that still ahead there are days of economic and emotional turbulence, to say the least. Zechariah's, Zechariah chapter 8 not only shows how the gospel comes to us, but also how it comes through us. The gospel is universal. People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Just as in the previous chapter of Zechariah, chapter 7, the Bethelites came to entreat the face of the Lord, so now all the nations are described in the same way. They come in waves. First, the Gentile leaders. Next in line are the city dwellers. And then finally, many people and strong nations. A small trickle becomes an overwhelming flood. The prophet envisions God's redeeming mercy for people from every tribe and people and language and nation. The gospel is personal. The gospel is the answer to my pain and my shame, my fear and my anxiety, not just in a general way, but in a personal way. Jesus loves me, this I know. Yes, the gospel is personal. In those days, 10 people from the nations of every tongue will seize the robe of a Judahite. By the way, I know most of your Bibles probably uh, say the robe of a Jew, but that's a little bit anachronistic. The, the, the idea of, the, of Jews and the Jewish people didn't, wasn't yet there in the time uh, of Zechariah. A more correct translation is Judahite because simply they lived in the Persian province of Yehud. But anyway, the point is that the gospel is personal. And that verb seize appears in context where the action is very fervent and impassioned. We want unbelievers to seize us, to ask us, what is it that we have that they don't? Oh, I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> a recent survey of 8,000 people who became believers indicates that 5% walked into a church and stayed. 7% came because of the pastor. 3% came because the church had a program they liked. 1% came through door-to-door -door visitation. 4% through Sunday school. And 80% came through invitations from friends or relatives. How about you? Who can you reach out to? Who can you help? The gospel is universal. 
the gospel is personal. It's one-on-one. -on -one. The gospel is vocal. That's how Zechariah 8 begins. God dwells with his people. Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. God is with his people. The confession reminding us of uh, Isaiah's prophecy of Emmanuel in Isaiah 7, 14. Emmanuel, that means what? God is with us. Romans 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing. When you speak kindly to your children on the playground, you are demonstrating the Holy Spirit's power for other moms. When you refuse to participate in office gossip, you are bringing honor to Jesus on your job. And even in your response to your own sin, admitting wrong, asking for forgiveness, you are testifying to the truth of the gospel you confess. And so to children who are wrestling with fear, we can say, Jesus conquered this. To the coworker who is burdened by frightening financial fears, we can say, Jesus died to redeem this. To those who are afraid of getting sick, afraid of dying, we say, Jesus stepped fully into the death, into death and demonstrated his ultimate victory even over this. Sadly, the opposite is also true. If we're unkind to those around us, if we speak harshly to our family members, if we don't reach out to those who are hurting, we are telling the world that Jesus is just a cliche. Jesus is an afterthought. Jesus is no big deal. Well, God forbid. Here comes the life-giving oxygen of the gospel. I want you to read this aloud with me. And I want you to put your own name in the blanks. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer, die, and rise in victory for, so that believing in Jesus as the Savior from sin shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. That is God's promise to you, of course, from John 3.16. A wonderful, life-giving, oxygen gospel promise for you. And one, of course, that you can easily share with others as well. But you know, the gospel isn't only black letters on white paper. The gospel is vibrant. It's neon and living color. The gospel provokes wonder and amazement. The gospel can be applied from a thousand angles. It invites people to have confidence and hope. The gospel breathes life into dead hearts. Do you see the need? Do you hear the cries? No doubt our plane, our world, continues in turbulent airspace. What are we to do? First, secure your own oxygen mask. Amen.